Welcome to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm Mike Horn, your host. And this podcast is for leaders and coaches who need and want fresh perspectives on what it means to live and to lead authentically. You're a leader who wants to make a difference, but sometimes you feel stuck. You know there's more to life and to leadership than what you're currently experiencing. It can be tough to figure out how to grow as a leader. You might be reading all the blogs and books, but it still feels like you're not making progress. You might even be feeling like you're doing everything wrong. On Authentic Change with Mike Horn, we interview experts who share their insights on how to live and lead authentically. Our guests are trendsetters in building great leaders, teams, and organizations. We provide fresh perspectives on what it means to live with purpose and authenticity. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast with Mike Horn. I am delighted to have as a guest in our virtual studio today, Francis Baldwin. Francis is a principal consultant at Design Wisdom Inc. Uh, she hails from Georgia. I am uh, absolutely uh, delighted to be uh, in conversation with Frances uh, today. She's a, a winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Organization Development Network. And uh, before I go on about Frances and let her go on about herself, uh, let me just say welcome, Frances. Thank you, Mike. I'm um, I'm excited to be here because of the topic. Yes, uh, we had a uh, meeting in advance of uh, today's discussion, uh, just in full disclosure to our audience. And today's conversation uh, that I-, I believe you'll find value in is in authenticity and the internal change agent. Francis spent a career as an internal change agent, and we're going to draw upon the experiences that uh, she shares and what it's like to uh, work at change and at leadership and authenticity and what's at the intersection uh, of all of that. I'm sure one of our um, uh, shared mentors, Charlie Seashore, uh, he always told me, Charlie always said that um, uh, there wasn't an intersection that couldn't be improved. (laughs) I think he was quoting an urban designer, but... uh, But uh, it's something that I believe in. So, Francis, uh, let's talk about your story. Talk about your corporate career. Okay. Um, Yeah. So, where I see myself now, uh, Mike, is I feel like I'm uh, an elder in the field with a um, with an agency for change, and I like to think that I'm like becoming wise. And I think the culmination of that, the coming together of that was becoming an internal OD person, seven years in one location and 13 years in the larger um, um, petrochemical business. And I think that's because when you're internal, you're on every day. So one of my mentors said to me once, well, in this situation, every move is a move. So as an internal, you're working with extremely bright people in an organization that is already successful and profitable. And Mike, I find those are the harder ones to change because they are doing well the way they are, you know, the way things are. Right. So you're there with these very, very bright people and your job is to bring added value. So that can be intimidating if you're not clear <clears throat> about who you are and what you bring and your capacity to look at any organization with the kind of diagnostic thing. So you're always bringing value in what you did in that um, 13 year career in petrochemicals. Um, you were certainly, as you were doing your work, as you were uh, making your moves, you were certainly exercising wisdom, I think. Is there a distinction between how you see wise and uh, wisdom today? Um, or, or, or or is it similar, just of a different uh, context? Okay. 
Yeah, I, I think I like that question because so wisdom, I read someplace where you can never define the source of your wisdom because to me, it's what we extrapolate from all of the knowledge and our experience of using that knowledge over and over. So some pattern of behavior, of the way things work, of a worldview comes into place. And because it's, um, it has some uh, veracity, it's, you know, it's, it has some standing, you believe in it. And so wisdom is all of that knowledge and experience that becomes, in a lot of ways, internalized. So the knowledge, I believe in enough to learn it. What does it mean? You know, what does it look like when you apply it? And then even the methods, you know, what are they supposed to accomplish? And then the values, when you look at all of that and you extrapolate from it, what's important to you. And I must add, what fits who you, how you see yourself? Because it's easy when it's congruent with who you are. Um, then that's wisdom. And you, and it's automatic. It's not like um, I open my wisdom box and say, you know, what do I want to talk with Mike about today? It's whatever we talk about, I will draw from these um, from these experiences. It's amazing. And that's how I think about uh, authenticity. It's, um, it's congruency of words and actions, and even better yet, yeah, when third uh, thoughts, words, and actions align, that kind of congruency creates um, authentic behavior. Right. In general, I think, you know, all of your work, uh, Dr. Baldwin, I mean, my work uh, has focused on having people and groups bring their best to a situation. Absolutely. So, how is it that our, we have to show up as change agents in order to work with these very technically accomplished people, as you um, noted, uh, I assume geoscientists, but also leaders across uh, big areas of uh, business? What, is it, what does it mean to uh, work authentically, to show up authentically? Can you do it uh, in these uh, kinds of change leadership roles? I think the last question is a good one. And it's not just the right to show up as who you are. I think you do the work that you're credible in showing up. And part of the first work for me, Mike, is to understand where you are. You know, what's the culture here? How do things work? And to show you how important that was to me when I realized, I, I think I told you when I was going traveling to my interview for Exxon, I felt definitely like I'm just now about to go to the other side of heaven. You know, right. they're like fortune um, on the fort, well, number one on the fortune list that year, probably, and all these different things. Um, so w- when I first joined the organization, I asked for permission to go around the country and interview some of the icons, especially those who were just leaving. It was at a time when they were really doing a lot of downsizing. And it amazed me. I had this thought before I went into the organization that often when this happens, a lot of knowledge and a lot of nuance goes out of the door and it's not left behind. So I got a list of who would all these people, the scientists with patents, you know, the best HR managers, the refining manager who was just um, a quirky guy and allowed to be quirky because he brought in so much money. But what do they know? And, and I had learned from a guy at Oxford University, a process for interviewing people who are competent to be able to understand and articulate their own competence. So I went in to ask them these questions that required them to think about, well, how do I know? How do I decide? What are my touch points? And it was a brilliant document. I'm sure it's somewhere in my files. But by doing that, I learned so much that was important to me as I went through every day that I went through an organization. It was important for me to understand who gets promoted, what's valued, how the organization sees growing people, what it takes for the organization to, to change, what the business cycles are and how it would affect anything that I'm doing. 
what state, you know, they are in, how the different business lines have character, like different companies. There was no such thing, if I can call my company as Exxon, there were all of these different companies and then business lines. So the first thing I think to be able to be yourself is to do it with an understanding of where you are, because that way, I think, being authentic, the language you used in one of your uh, articles about self-awareness, you talked about um, um, knowing who you are, knowing yourself, knowing your, I had done a lot of work before I went to Exxon on myself, on my inner self, who I wanted to be. So I wasn't, I was over-prepared for where I was, but I was just prepared enough to, for that. So I would stop by saying the first thing is know where you are, what the guidelines are. And I can't just adapt and become one of them, but I know what boundaries to bump up against. And when I want to bump up against a boundary, I need to have a solid foundation, a reason for doing that. And sometimes you have to be in that state of ambiguity where you're stretching and just hoping it's going to go well because you believe so much in your own process. It seems to me that you know, all of this uh, came together, this um, uh, knowing where you are, boundaries, um, and uh, establishing um, a foundation for your work. All of this, uh, in many ways, was a product of the interviews that you conducted, it seems, that... And I often wonder now if we've gravitated to a period where um, we neglect the power of the executive interview or the leadership Absolutely. interview Absolutely. because there's so much data that is survey says. <laughs> Listen, these guys, and they were all guys, they were wonderful. They were so impressed that I asked. Right. They gave me everything. They gave me the... Uh, the letter from years ago when they were in this downsize, what the then president said to the employees about the downsize and the current letter of what the president to let me know that a lot depended on the leadership. But the other type of thing they gave me because I was trying to understand the mentality of the engineer, right? They gave me a document that was written in 1947 that I treasure. It's called The Unwritten Rules of engineering. And for the engineer, I mean, it's a long list. A university professor did it. It told you everything from don't surprise your boss to keep your fingernails clean. It had everything on there. So it told me a number of things about this, that culture, but how rigid they were around that, around that, uh, the culture of being an engineer. That's uh, maybe a culture uh, of uh, fitting people into boxes. Uh, and I assume in, in an organization or in that merged organization, um, there were really long development paths for people to uh, rise through the ranks of the organization. Absolutely. And you definitely, every, everyone wanted to be on a path. Right. So the few people, I met a few people and I call them the... Um, like the glue that holds things together. There were a few people, a lot of them in middle management are, who didn't want to grow up to be president. They love contributing where they were. They didn't want an extra title. They know that what they did every day contribute to the success of the organization. But otherwise, everyone was on a, was on a, a path. And even I was on a path. I learned from these guys Everyone in the organization, if you're going any place, you have a sponsor. So for me, fortunately, the senior executive vice president for human resource in New York was my sponsor. So I was protected in some ways um, because he was watching my progress where I was being assigned. And he did, you know, they, he snatched me out of situations, literally several times because you've contributed all you can contribute, they're not going to change beyond that. And um, it's interesting as I think about or I wonder about um, career paths, particularly for internal change agents, organization development consultants, um, people in culture, shapers, uh, community builders. 
I wonder about um, career paths. Um, here, here you are working with uh, these people who are certainly climbing, you know, corporate uh, bladders as they were or are, and the aspirations for someone working in, you know, the realm of organization behavior or organization learning. Uh, these are often limited pathways. So where do you think the real juice comes from, right, uh, in terms of personal values, in terms of uh, being able to exercise your agency in those situations as you get to know the context? Well, I think the first part of it comes from personally. You know, so here I am and I go into this situation and I'm using all of myself and I see a person change. I mean. It makes you believe in what you're doing when you can see a person change some important dimension of themselves. The other thing is to see the organization in some ways um, making changes or using what you have. But the big part of the uh, response to the question that you have, there is no career path. There is no formal career path for you. That's the value in having a sponsor who knows the work that you're doing. Because first of all, you're placed into HR. And generally, HR doesn't have a full appreciation of the value of what you're doing compared to what they do. So the first opportunity I was offered in in the first five years I was there was to become an HR person. You'd make a good HR manager. So the way they saw for me to grow was to become a part of the system and become an HR manager. Now, the incentives came because When I negotiated my salary and I was asking for more money than I'd ever made, it was tongue in cheek. It was probably not that big a deal. Um, But the person, the same executive vice president said to me, if you perform as well as I think you're going to perform in your first 18 months, I would give you a $10,000 raise. So I did and he did. So I was being awarded from the by, from the corporate level for the work that I was doing, not necessarily at the local level. So, um, so the incentives came because someone was monitoring what I was doing and how it contributed to the history of OD in Exxon. You know, right. it was it was growing that same uh, stream and also rewarding me by giving me a different position. So I was moved out of the six years where I really learned the most, got my complete immersion was in the old petroleum part in Houston. But I was immediately moved to a um, to another um, experimental department that put up then to Exxon Research and then to Europe. So the reward was that my work was being recognized and my pay was increasing. But I didn't need the traditional title. So much of this is about uh, the role of sponsorship. And as you introduced yourself, you um, I heard word uh, a word elder, and certainly we heard, discussed the word wise. Is sponsorship a part of uh, uh, being an elder, uh, being a distinguished uh, colleague in organization uh, development? Uh, or it, sponsorship is is different. It's larger. It's broader. But uh, do you see that related to the role, Francis, of yeah. uh, being an elder? Yeah, in the field, in our field, it's the mentor. Uh-huh. And I don't know if you saw the article I wrote a few weeks ago on is mentoring a lost art to OD, because I talked about the fact that um, of the role that mentors play. Um, I feel that responsibility and I I find myself in that role, whether I intend to or not, because people sort of come to you. And in the article, I was saying, when I tell a story to a newer person, a younger person, they ask a question. I said, let me tell you a story, which I used to resent in old people. They always had a story, you know, and now I realize that stories teach and they just light up. You know, this guy said to uh-huh. me, you know what, You that was the best answer you could have given me because I know what it looks like. But what I say in the article, as mentors, 
we answer the questions that the mentee never thought to ask because we know what's important. So it takes the form of mentoring in um, in OD, but some people felt it at a deeper level as sponsorship, such as Herb Shepard. I told you the reason I ended up at Exxon is because Herb Shepard, I had a conversation one night about my future with him. His 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 topic was my future. I was excited about what I was doing already. But when I said, I really would like corporate experience, he said, well, I think you can do that. And are you interested? Well, I was looking for consulting contracts to add to my resume. And I get this package from Exxon saying, Herb Shepard said, we should take a look at you. These are the places in the world where we have openings for OD people. Will you come talk to us? Well, that was a very intimidating response, but it felt like that's a spot more of our mentor. That's a sponsor, you know. And uh, yes, I mean, clearly those are uh, two great examples. I mean, from uh, of uh, sponsorship, um, I'm you know thinking about mentoring and mentorship because uh, perhaps they're related. I think they're distinguishable, but. You have written that mentoring is a relationship for mutual learning and uh, have issued a call to action that, you know, for people who care about uh, organization development and uh, sustaining the subtleties of what we do, uh, that it's important work that we take on. How does how does one get involved in that? How does, um, you, you know, one... Um, get connected with a mentor. Many of our colleagues are uh, independent uh, consultants. Um, they're scrambling for work uh, or they're inside organizations, uh, perhaps in uh, different sorts of roles. How is it that you connect with a mentor? Well, you know, like most things in OD, it's an organic, undefined process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I think there are structured ways. And I was very proud of the ODNET years ago when we did a research project on mentoring and started to sponsor mentoring sessions at the conference where people would come in, understand the role of mentoring and be uh, matched up with people who they would have an opportunity to speak to several times during the conference. But it was to stimulate in the mentors and in the mentees to reach out to cultivate these. Now, And it all depends on where you sit also, Mike. Mm -hmm. I've done more of it since I started co-teaching at Bowling Green. It's a natural process because I'm in touch with the students and they want more. Um, They they want more on the little side comments that I make with my sense of humor than, than formally what we're teaching. And there's something in that. So I think there's no, um, but I think the professional organizations can do more. I just think about the people who are, I'm glad that Rolf Linton wrote his book because Rolf Linton captures everything he does to make meaning of it. I mean, I've seen pages and pages and pages that he calls an article. Um, But to sit at the feet of Rolf Linton and ask him the questions about what work, what doesn't work, and you know, how do you keep your motivation going? It's so how you believe in what you believe in and how do you sort of finally start framing your own framework for what's work and sort of being able to work in that, regardless of where you're going. Um, I think that things like that are just invaluable. So I am making a proposal to the OB network um, to, to do more with that. These corporate um, systems um, of which you've been part of, they provide, uh, it seems, uh, they provided a unique opportunity to work on several or many different sorts of projects. And you had a sponsor for your work in the head of uh, human resources. Um, What's the and certainly you paved a way for yourself, um, you know, given the interview work and the boundaries that you established and the credentials you brought to the situation. How did you develop relationships with clients? Did you have uh, a score of many? Um, 
did you have a, a few very well placed executives? How did you think of that relationship during your tenure in that organization? Well, I knew the first thing was I was going to seek them outside of HR. <laughs> that right. the people in HR, well meaning, but they just didn't understand enough. So when um, my one of my first roles was executive education, it was wonderful. It was so cool because now I'm going to be working with these executives at different levels, and they will often work on projects that they are concerned about. And they would say, can you come help me with that? But then I had another sponsor. I call him my invisible sponsor. He was the vice president for refining. And this guy was brilliant, number one. But he came from the refining organization. And I think I may have mentioned to you that the refining organization is one of the places in Esso and Standard Oil where the T group and adult learning and finally OD really took roots. And in the refining organization, it was like one of those organizations that it just penetrated. And during those early days, during the Shepherd Mouton, um, those days, um, Exxon sent 800 people through the T group. So that gave us a significant number of people who at least had this skill of self-knowledge and understanding stuff, et cetera. So Besides the refining manager being a being brilliant in what he does, his our whole organization had that culture that was very receptive to OD. So when I, the biggest project that I was asked to do was this big building capital improvement project, adding on a process to a refinery. Um, the project manager asked if I could do that, came to my HR manager and they said, no, you don't have enough time. Well, he immediately went to refining and said, you know, we got to have her to do this. And he um, overrode <laughs> the right. HR manager. And so, so that's a delicate political thing in some ways, because you, one of the things is to seize the opportunity. So it wasn't just that he saw me work. Every time the refinery manager had a problem that I could help him with. If he called, I answered right down to when he was the uh, sponsor of United Way. Who has time for that? Right. He needed people to get in there and train people. I went there, you know, I did what he needed to do and helped him resolve that. So when I needed something, he was he was really always there. He just found a way and teased me very hard about breaking protocol um, <laughs> and, and what it was going to cost me. And it did. In some ways, though, it is a story about reciprocity, though, in exchange. It is. It is. And there were certainly there are certainly element, elements of uh, power in that story and the exercise uh, of power and how, you know, you see it as uh, divisible or uh, expandable. Right. And it's, it wasn't um, the exercise of power didn't have to do with my visibility or my getting access, it was in the good of the organizations, just as the refinery project. Um, I wouldn't have been allowed to go had he not intervened, but as I told you, at the end of that project, because it was done so differently, it just got everybody who had to be involved with that plan, right down to the future maintenance people involved in the concept of how it was being built. And at the end, the project manager wrote a letter to me copied the HR manager and said, because of the way you had us to work, I had this war room where everyone came. Um, we finished on the budget, ahead of schedule, and with fewer lost time injuries than any major construction project we've ever had. So the effort, the stretch that I made to help that happen, turned out to be worthy um, of the cause. Uh, I didn't get that kind of credit from the HR manager, but it was very rewarding for the refinery manager. It was very rewarding for New York, so much so that they had this ongoing unpublished history, and it was the last project that they entered into it, um, was that project and how it came out. 
Francis, how did you uh, reconcile yourself with the industry? Every industry has its uh, upsides and downsides. Uh, you know, I worked in uh, big pharmaceutical industries, lots of upsides and downsides in that equation. Uh, I worked in, uh, you know, hospitality uh, at Marriott International. Uh, lots of uh, upsides to that organization in terms of employment and lots of uh, downsides in terms of, um, you know, keeping a working poor working poor. Um how did you th- uh, think about uh, you know your work? I mean, your values in relationship to the you know bigger picture of the industry. Uh, you have a thing for asking the right question. Mm-hmm. That gets to be very important because when I got that package with the big Exxon logo on it, all I can think of was you know exploiting the oil, exploiting the land, blah 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 blah. All I could think about all those things, and I felt certainly if I go, I'm sleeping with the enemy. And the conversations I had with myself and some of my colleagues was maybe you can do more damage or more good inside the organization than you can do outside critiquing it. So I only expected to be there three years at the most. So I was surprised I was there for 13. But um, I think what happened, the first thing that helped me to get over um, that I have to go in and fight this big monster uh, who has is, is interested in nothing but profit to get inside and see how they treated their people uh, to get inside and learn the, the quality of the people who were there and I said all these bright good-hearted people came to work these organizations as teenagers and they are still here um, so that was a part of it uh, and there were several um, poignant moments for me in that one was um, and I take a lesson from a woman named Barbara, I think it's McClintock. Hmm. Barbara McClintock was a woman scientist. Have you heard of her? Yes. Yeah, so Barbara McClintock, someone asked her a question, how can you just persistently come up with so many products and so many uh, uh, variations on what you can do with corn? She said, the first thing you have to do is you have to get a feel for the organism that you're working with. Hmm. So... I always remember that lesson. So I had to allow myself to get a feel for this organism as just as legitimate as any other organism. It just had its, it just had its culture. And the time that became important to me was, first of all, that they even asked me to go to Brussels because there were people in the organization who literally hated me because I got that invitation that they had never gotten. Everybody's dream is that they would move you to Brussels and put you in an unbelievable uh, apartment. Uh, You have access to all the European countries where we work. And when I went over and just the money they gave me before I left to shop for European um, compatible electronics and whatever else you want, I bought antiques. Um, (laughs) But also the just a huge jump in my, I think that was the first time I was really at six figures and that was in 89, you know, that was sort of not normal. Um, but also being in another country and it was a quick move. I didn't, I got the crash course in uh, French, uh, didn't even bother with the Flemish. Um, but I was there. I didn't know anyone there before I left, except a couple of people I met at international OD conferences. I felt well taken care of. So my secretary was my personal assistant. She called every day of the week, weekends, to make sure that I'm all right. <clears throat> the guy was reporting to the same thing. But when I'd be when I'd fly into Italy, another country, and I'm driving away from the airport in my limousine, of course, I look up and see this sign that says "Esso," and my heart would literally jump. It's like I identified with that sign so much, and so it helped me to understand the loyalty of the people who did the cleanup from Valdez, the guys who went out with rags washing down the rocks on the shore. Um, Once I interviewed them, I understood, you know, you, you, you gotta have a feel for something. So Barbara McClintock was right. It was, they had decided this was their organization. This was um, cradle to grave. And they really wanted Exxon to look better in Alaska. 
But when I debriefed them, I came to understand it, Mike. And even though to this day, I understand, you know, the uh, dominance. Um, I understand the dominance and um, I understand the that Exxon, what they do best is manage money. And there's a determination uh, and how strategic they can be. That's, you know, that's who they are. So it was, it took some work to do that, but I think I had to create a perspective and put it in that perspective. Uh, besides, I will tell you the bottom line is someone told me, so, ah, you've been there for years to make a contribution. Now you're going to work to make money. <laughs> so it was a good part of my uh, financial security, future, you know, security. But um, I came to appreciate the organization without totally buying in its place in the whole financial and society uh, world. It, it is about uh, integrity. It is. Uh, about, uh, you know, the whole cloth, about um, uh, showing up as uh, we are. So uh, it's a great, um, it's a great uh, illustration, I think, uh, Francis, of uh, authenticity and integrity and uh, uh, what it means to work in a system with, uh, with that view uh, of a system as an organism. And Francis, if our audience wanted to be in touch with you, how would they get in touch with you? How would they be in contact with you? What's the easiest way to find Dr. Francis Baldwin? I think the easiest way is uh, just on my email, francis.baldwin at cox.net on LinkedIn. Uh, one of the characteristics of myself is I'm the world's poorest marketer. <laughs> um, but I do have a website that's under construction. If they went to designwisdom.org, they would see a website in the making that I plan to work on. And so my interest right now, just in terms of, you know, I am not looking to work in organizations so much as I'm looking to work with people. I want to coach, uh, shadow consult maybe, but uh, my big work is to help people to learn how to be effective and um and um in and in, in their lives and their and their work all at the same time. It's interesting, you know, as we have uh, a number of convergent paths given you know our experiences in very big systems. Um I um I think so much of our careers we're looking down the funnel, you know, starting at an organizational level. Uh, and thinking about uh, the individual or certainly thinking about the context of those uh, levels of system. And as we become uh, teachers, mentors, uh, it really is starting uh, from the other end of the funnel, isn't it, in some ways? Right. And two things I would say about that. Um, one is, you, you know, when you get inside, you come to know a lot of things. Like uh, Valdez was very... Um, revealing because what I discovered, you know, people were criticizing the CEO because he wouldn't speak publicly. Mike, he didn't know how. He was so insulated and he, he wouldn't know how to do that. So he knew the company line and it just fell flat. So that's one thing of learning what acculturation does to uh, a person. There was something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, that the is the power. That's a great example of the power of culturation. Great. It is. It, 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 you become. That's who you become. I didn't know how. I, I, I left before they got to me. But <laughs> um, but the other thing uh, that I wanted to say was, oh, around integrity. So when you, all this inner work, when you're doing, you also decide what your boundaries are. And to me, integrity was one of them. So at no point did I feel like my integrity was being violated or that I was asking people to violate the integrity of the organization or the public or anyone. And that was important uh, to me. I mean, there were guys I discovered, I'm a Christian. I discovered that at six o'clock in the morning, there were these guys who met at six o'clock in the morning to pray for the organization and everything in the morning. And I was able to slip in just because I found a Bible on somebody's desk and asked them what it was doing there. So there's a whole you know, world inside of this, but I felt comfortable about the integrity 
the integrity part. Another um, reason uh, to bring who you are to what you do. A- absolutely. And to find the right kinds of environments uh, that create the right kind of psychological safety to do that. Yeah, it is. And the bravery it takes and the courage it takes to bring who you are to what you do. It takes courage. It takes risk. It, it, it takes being able to step out in ambiguity and get rewarded for it to know it's okay. It was it was the right thing to do. And the managers used to say to me, I like talking to you and working to you, so I'm going to learn something different. So in order to learn something different, they had to listen, try on something, try on something different. So, um, yeah, that was uh, that was quite a learning. But it does take courage, and it takes a toll, I think, on um, your health if you're not working on it 100% of the time. Like, I know that eight months before I left Exxon, my orthopedic doctor said, for a woman your age, you have no arthritis anywhere in your body. And people have talked about this and I've seen it. You leave corporate life and you step outside and everything you've suppressed or pushed down someplace gets manifested. All of a sudden I have a serious case of rheumatoid arthritis. And it was all of that bravery that I put forth collapsing into now, okay, this is this is the consequence. It had to go someplace. I don't think I did enough work on that. So you had asked for a last word, and I have one. Yes, yes. We're there. It's <laughs> not original. It's just one that touched my soul because I talk a lot about building your inner self, building the inner, building yourself. So Barbara Wall, you may remember from HP, was, I think she was a thought leader, really, because she's the one who took HP from promoting being the best technology company in the world to being the best technology company for the world. But she wrote about uh, being yourself, and she said, um, by authenticity, she means both being true to yourself and inventing a self that's worth being true to. Those are powerful words are on which to close to, to live by and to live by. I've uh, so enjoyed uh, this conversation and discussion uh, with Dr. Francis Baldwin on this episode of the Authentic Change podcast. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to be in touch with uh, Francis Baldwin, please find her on uh, LinkedIn or find her at her email address, francis.baldwin at cox.net. Or you can see her website under construction, which is designwisdominc.com or designwisdom.org. Okay, great. And that'll all be in the show notes as well. So uh, again, um, I think this is a great opportunity to be in touch with uh, Francis uh, Baldwin. Um, Maybe the best time to... uh, tap into this uh, sagacity at this point, this wise uh, uh, nature of Francis Baldwin, a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner in from the Organization Development Network. It's been a privilege, a delight, and honor uh, to have this conversation with you, Francis. Uh, so thank you again so much. Thank you, Mike. I've enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, as well. Until the next episode of the Authentic Change Podcast, stay well. Thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm delighted that you've tuned in to listen. Please visit the show notes for links to topics discussed in today's podcast. To download a free ebook on authentic change and leadership and to subscribe to my newsletter, please visit mike-horn.com. Once again, M-I-K-E dash H-O-R-N-E dot com, Mike dash horn dot com. Once again, thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast.